everybody, it's Paul Yeager. This is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. This week, we are going to dive into the farm bill and specifically crop insurance. William Cole is from Batesville, Mississippi. Right now, he's the chair of the Crop Insurance Professionals Association, which earned him a seat at the Senate Agriculture Committee hearing a couple of weeks ago in Washington, D.C., specifically about the farm bill. We're going to go heavy on crop insurance and where he sees from a crop insurance perspective, also a farmer from Mississippi, what role crop insurance plays and how it can find space and a um, couple of places to expand and at least solidify in the next farm bill. That's the discussion today. We're going policy hunting with William Cole. You were actually out in the field this week. What were you doing? Well, we uh, were trying to get our, our corn fertilized and our soybeans. We uh, are trying to get sprayed, uh, and it won't stop raining here. So uh, we, we do a few acres a day, and then it rains again. So you have corn, soybeans. What else? Yeah, well, that's all we have this year. Uh, we, we intended to plant some rice, but it was a little rainy early in the season, and we just couldn't get all of our ground prepared for rice planting this year ground prepared because of the rain or just other factors no no the rain yes uh yeah we we, we got about half the corn we wanted planted and and then uh no rice and we had to switch over to soybeans because it's obviously a later later planting period there you're in the northern part of the state is that right that's right yes about an hour south of memphis in the north part of the delta you have been have you been in an area where there has been rain the last few years uh yes yes uh the last Oh, two or three planting seasons have, have been exceptionally wet. Uh, we we get fronts comes from the Gulf of Mexico that come north, and then we get all of the fronts with the jet stream coming from the west. So uh, well, I guess you could say we're blessed with plenty of moisture here. And that's uh, something that uh, not even, what, 100 and, or maybe 200 miles to your west is not the same story? <laughs> no, no. I, friends of mine, fellow agents uh, from Texas, uh, they, those guys, uh, they, they can't catch a break. It, I think they're on a multi-year drought that just doesn't seem to be getting any relief right now. What does uh, your farm set up? Is it just you or do you farm with somebody? No, uh, my uh, my son re recently graduated from Mississippi State uh, with an ag degree uh, in precision ag, which is a which is an interesting degree. Uh, technology is pretty amazing, but he has recently taken over and managing our farm, which is taking a lot of the pressure off of me. Uh, he can do the day-to-day -day operations, and I can uh, uh, stay in the office and, and work on more crop insurance. Is that okay? Uh, he's doing a great job, yeah. <laughs> Every, everything's great. It's a funny story. I, I went to help him the other day, and 15 minutes I was there, I, I, I broke the tore up the water trailer. <clears throat> so I think I got fired that day. <laughs> You and I have some commonality, William. That's what I always used to say. I was really good at breaking stuff. That's right. So That's it's supposed I'm to be the other way around. around. It's supposed to be the son uh, making uh, mistakes instead of dad. So, yeah. it's, so now it's, did you have a uh, family that farmed that you took over from? No, it's interesting. My dad uh, uh, sold school buses, and uh, and so I, I didn't grow up with any farming in uh, my family Uh I, but I loved agriculture, and I actually thought I wanted to trade commodities uh, back out of school. And I realized real soon I didn't want to sit in front of a computer and wear a coat and tie every day. So I uh, got an opportunity to get in the crop insurance business, which is uh, dealing with farmers every day. And this is my 28th year doing it. So uh, it, it love agriculture, but I didn't have any background. So you, you'd rather stare at numbers of insurance than numbers of trend lines uh, on corn and soybeans. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> so why crop insurance? You said working with farmers has is, is been something. I mean, I always feel that those in insurance, you kind of are cut different. Yeah, you know, it, it's such a, a niche, interesting business that, you know, we we meet with farmers now and it's evolved over the years. We used to when I first got into this, it was pretty much look at your uh, yields and determine what the best coverage was for the farmer. But, you know, and now the way this evolved is we're working with every USDA program. Uh, we're meeting with these guys and uh, in, in working with all of the programs they might qualify for FSA and RCS, dealing with their bankers on their uh, crop loans and their guarantees. So I, I guess you'd say we're kind of a, a, a wraparound 100% uh, farm advisor now and not just a crop insurance agent. Hmm? When did that change? 
you know, I, I would say four or five years ago uh, when they started, uh, maybe the last farm bill, maybe back to 18 when we started uh, having a lot more interaction with crop insurance and other FSA programs. And I always get things are evolving. What is driving the most change in crop insurance? I think technology. Uh, yeah, I, and, and we're, we're needing to, uh, and, and crop insurance is unique uh, because it's ever uh, developing and evolving. Uh, the R&D and then the process you might have heard of called the 508H process, there's, there are continuously um, new improvements and new policies and cover more crops. So uh, you, can't, you can't get uh, comfortable because you, you better go to every, every update school and every training you can get or you'll, you'll fall behind pretty quick in, in this business. Okay, so you're sitting at your office chair, and I'm guessing you meet with clients that might sit right there to your left when they come in. At what point, when you see an eye kind of glaze over or roll back, that you have to kind of dial back and, and go again? Or, or, or are most of your customers, they're all in, they get every single thing you're telling them? You know, it, it, it runs the gamut. I'd say from the guys that um, really get into the weeds and want to know every intricate part of the policy, uh, you know, to the guys that, you know, we actually become their trusted advisor. They say, you know, what level do you think I need? And which is, puts a lot of burden on, on us uh, to really know and, and know all the background of the guy's farming operation to make sure we, we give the right advice uh, as far as the levels of covers. Has crop insurance been the best thing for farming to provide as much stability in an unstable world? You know, right now, as I as I said last week in, in, in a testimony I gave to the Senate, it's really the only uh, safety net right now. Um, the, the, the programs at FSA uh, aren't keeping up with the markets. They haven't updated the prices. Um, and so uh, there's just no, there's, there's no way we drop to those uh, levels uh, as far as market prices. So Crop insurance actually, uh, it, it corrects or, or, or is driven straight from the futures markets on our price guarantees and it's whatever their yields are, uh, their, their 10-year APHs or, or actual production history. So uh, right now we're the only only safety net they have. So, uh, that, so it's really, really important for us to get it right every year. And, and you talk about stability and, 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 and safety net. And when I say it's... And then you, it's tied to what the commodity market's doing. That's as about as equitable as you can come up with, right? Otherwise, it probably feels like government has a little too much thumb on the scale. Yeah, that, that's right. So yeah, each year, uh, you know, we start off the year. We, they they have a discovery period straight from the board of trade. So you know that's relevant. Uh, their yields are updated uh, every year on every crop. Uh, we can even actually go down to the farm serial number or, or in other parts of the country, the section is how they keep it. So, you know, you can separate it out. You can put your whole farm together based off of that current market. And, uh, and, and then there, there are other um, uh, extra, I guess you'd say, uh, um, add-ons you can add to that, like extra replants or private product hail coverage and that kind of thing. So, you know, so you got your base underlying policy. Then you've got a lot of options that you can add to that. I think you told me uh, last week when we talked on the phone that crop insurance is one of those that farmer has an investment, a skin in the game type of thing. And, and that probably puts a lot of on the conservative side of politics and fiscal understanding of they want the private person to have uh, investment in things. And so it's not just a, a government uh, I can't right. believe I'm going to say it. I'm not going to say handout, but right. a government subsidy. Yeah, that you're you're exactly right. Every uh, every level of coverage has a has a uh, has a, a premium support rate, if, if you will. So the government pays a portion of it, and, and the producer actually pays a portion of it. So you know when he elects uh, seventy five or eighty percent coverage, um, you know he's got a significant outlay uh, in, in in expenses into acquiring that coverage. So it's not. Uh, you know, for guys that don't understand federal crop, it's, it's in no means a government handout. Uh, it's, it's a true insurance policy that that farmer is paying for. You were you, you alluded to it. You were in D.C. a couple of weeks ago testifying in front of the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, what were you trying to? Well, w well first of all, who are you there on behalf of? Just you? No, the the we, the. Uh, the the testimony uh, that I gave uh, was on for I was representing the Crop Insurance Professionals Association, which is a, a group of crop insurance uh, agents 
um, and and uh, farm credits and other lenders that that sell crop insurance from all over the nation. So, and I'm the I'm the chairman of that organization, and was fortunate enough to uh, that uh, to be asked to testify. There were two other uh, company uh, CEOs also t- giving testimony. So you're there on behalf of crop insurance in in that group. What were you trying to? I mean, you get to do an opening statement. What were you trying to nail there in your opening statement? You know, I really wanted to express uh, how important as a, 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 that that crop insurance is not just to our farmers, but to our whole rural communities. And the number one overlying thing is just to protect it. Uh, you know, don't let, let any 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 cuts or any uh, or any changes to the program that might undermine how, how great it's working so far. And then the next thing is, you know, there. Uh, we always want to evolve and change and, and, and provide better coverage uh, to more uh, producers throughout the nation. And so we had some ideas there how to, to, how to strengthen the program and, and maybe get away from some of these ad hoc disasters that they're, they've been paying out every year. But how do we get away from paying out those? You know, th- there's several ideas that, that are getting some traction uh, that I think are, are uh, the viability is getting explored. Some of, them, uh, some of those would be uh, increasing the premium support rate at some of the higher levels. So if you look at the premium support rate, when you get to the over 75%, the premium support actually is lowered. So it's, it's inverse. The lower levels get the higher subsidy or premium rate. So we're, we're really looking at increasing the premium support at the higher levels, which would uh, incentivize covering more of your own farm risk uh, and, and obviously, you've got to pay premium, as we discussed. So uh, if a guy had an 85% versus a 65%, be, it would be less likely that you would need ad hoc. So that's really when only ad hoc's been kicking in, is when somebody is below that 75%? Well, in areas where, and that, that's not necessarily the case, but we're hoping that if a guy had a higher level of coverage, there would be less need for it. Okay, I get you. But I think I joked with you about we've had these, uh, we didn't even know what they were called, these derechos. Um, those types of disasters happen. Right. But how does crop insurance fit into that discussion uh, to to step in when the government maybe doesn't need to step in? Yeah, you know, in that the derechos really got complicated because if you remember, there were, there were a lot of grains that were already in the grain bin. Uh, and harvested, and then the storms hit those grain bins. So it really got complicated. <clears throat> it wasn't simply you had a crop in the field and and you lost it to flood, and that was a very easy one to adjust. So uh, the the situation you guys had is was a little different, but it, it seems like you had another one recently. So uh, it, it seems like they're more common. Um, three. We've had three of them, William. <laughs> three. There you go. That's it's ridiculous. Right. I've <laughs> never heard of this thing, and here I've had three in the last three years. You know, one example I could give you in a traditional type disaster right. is in 2012, if you remember, you guys had one of the worst droughts on, on history up there. Um, the Midwest, the rates are a little lower. There's a very good example. If you go across the I states or the Corn Belt, they traditionally have 80 or 85 percent there. And one of the worst droughts, the most money ever paid out in federal crop insurance, if you remember right, there was no disaster program for that year. So that tells you, when in a year like that, when you have high levels of coverage, uh, it it really does uh, it really does facilitate uh, those farmers getting paid timely within that year where they had the disaster. And if there is a disaster needed, normally you don't get it for a year and a half or two later, which is, you know, it helps. But it sure would be better if you got it actually in the year that where you had the problem. Yeah, farmers are used to being able to delay some of their their checks. But man, when you delay it 18 months, uh, that gets to be uh, an issue, I would imagine. Yes. Is yeah, what you're right. And, you know, the bankers, it's hard to tell them, well, I got, I got a disaster coming. Just hold it's time, coming. You know? Yeah, it's coming. Well, give yeah, me some slack. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't play well. Um, okay. Those that at least watch this program, they understand, you know, we show a lot of uh, uh, Senate hearings, House hearings, things like that. There is a, there's a couple of things from where you sit that we don't see at home. You see lots of uh, senators come, go, in, out. House has the same issue. Um, I know you get asked some of the same questions as the morning or as the session goes on. What were the questions that you received? The uh, the first question, as, as you uh, know from 
where I'm located, we don't have a lot of specialty crops in, in the Delta of Mississippi. It, it's pr traditional row crops here. So the first question that I got was from Senator Stavenow from Michigan, and specialty crops are uh, really important to her, and there's uh, the whole farm coverage uh, is really important to her. And so the first question she she came out of the gate asking about that. So uh, I had to I had to be ready uh, to answer that question it, because look, Whole Farm really works for those specialty crop guys. So I had to learn a little more about Whole Farm. And those guys have a problem with Whole Farm. There are uh, actually liability limits on that policy. So you know, in in, in say corn. You could have a 20,000 acre farmer that would, you know, and, and we cover him. I mean, it doesn't really matter what, how much his liability is. But with specialty crops, you take a, a, a large vineyard or, or a big, you know, a, a really diversified specialty crop producer in California or Oregon or, Cal or Washington, uh, there might, he might can only cover a certain amount of coverage. So there's a big need. To, uh, to raise the limit or either take the limit off of that whole farm coverage where those guys can get adequate coverage. Uh, one one, one uh, analogy I heard is you need those bigger, good producers in the program because that lowers the premium for everybody on the rating. Uh, someone gave the analogy to the equivalent of taking a healthy young person out of a health insurance pool. You know, it, if you're only insuring the, the, the older guys or the, or, or the ones in the smaller bad, bad health guys, and then, you know, everybody's premium is going to be really high. Right. Um, okay. I asked you, I think I spooked you the other day when I asked you specifically, because I was going off of that question from Stabenow, yeah. asking you about specialty crops. Define yeah. specialty crops because that has changed. Yeah. So spe specialty crops, and there is actually a list of specialty crops, uh, uh, and it's not uh, it, it it takes your your blueberries, um, uh, citrus, <clears throat> um, your grapes, uh, all all of the all of those peaches, all of that goes into the specialty crop. Uh, if it's uh, and I can I can uh, get a list for you, but and it is a it is a large list, but. Uh, uh one one I had a small the top I can give you a real quick list the top uh, specialty crops would be uh, apples uh, blueberries uh, almonds or almonds as some of the West Coast guys say <laughs> grapes uh, you know citrus fruit those those make up the ma vast majority of our of our specialty crops basically it's fruits and vegetables versus the other crops that's that's exa that's exactly right yeah so in the old days uh, 20 years ago you thought specialty crops was cotton sorghum rice that's not the case anymore why what when did that change do you know uh, in, in in i can't name the specific time when that that changed but uh as far as crop insurance uh the, the there's a delineation there um in and how those are categorized, and I can't remember when exactly that was uh, that was changed. Though, I, my understanding it was maybe four farm bills ago. So yeah. it's it and it, that's every five years. So we'll say we'll just go twenty years and we'll just smile and nod and move on. There you uh, go. Do you <laughs> think, William? That uh, I'm sorry. So if Senator Stabenow, Michigan, blueberries, fruits. Mm. There's a lot of stuff up there. They have a lot of trees. Different diversity. Uh, so I get what, what why she's asking on that behalf. What were some of the other questions that you had that day? You know, um, so some of the issues uh, that were were tying, uh, uh, it, and it wasn't directed to me, but it was to the panel. But and I can't remember exactly the ones that I that I answered. But some really important issues are, uh, you know, the as you well know, climate smart practices are, are big big buzz in, in agriculture now. And, uh, and, and we, from crop insurance perspective, we think there's a danger in, uh, in, in, in making it mandatory or tying uh, premium support to, uh, to climate smart. Uh, you know, I think anything that's incentive based is a really good idea, you know, and as I would probably say that uh, our farmers may be the best stewards of the earth, they're, they're out there. So I think giving those guys the tools, a really good crop insurance program, and then maybe some incentive based programs are a good way to attack uh, these issues as far as climate smart. Uh, one other issue is, uh, is, is having pay limits put on crop insurance. Similar deal to what we talked about in specialty crops. If you put a pay limit on, uh, on, on crop insurance, uh, it would undermine the program, and, and a lot of your bigger producers would get out, and, and you, you would have an adverse effect on how it was operated. So we need to be cautious 
about anything uh, putting a limit on our payments there. So, uh, so is that over that when you say payment limit, is that the over seventy five percent part that you were talking about, or I might no, be confusing it there? So, in some of the some of the other FSA programs, if you'll know, they're like a two fifty payment limit for different you know disasters, you know, or, or however many individuals make up your farm and entity, each one will have a payment limit. So, you know, we don't ever want to have that in crop insurance. So, uh, so that that's where uh, you know, because the guy's paying for his coverage. You know, if he he should he should not have a, a a limit on how much how many acres that that he farms or that he insures. I see, I see. Okay, um, so there's questions that come from the senators in the room, and then there's the real questions that come from staff. Uh, you get to have discussions with staff. What's been some of the follow up um, as as the Senate tries to craft their version of the farm bill? Yeah, right now we're dealing with a, an issue um, that's that's specific to our crop insurance. Um, it will be, uh, I don't know if we have enough time today to explain how our commission's calculated. It is a very complicated formula that, that uh, is a, 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 and it's a factor of the administrative and operating expense that the federal government pays the, pays the companies. Uh, so to summarize that, <clears throat> back in 2010, when a new standard reinsurance agreement was negotiated, um, there was a, a factor applied to that. So depending on how much the A&O calculated, then crop insurance uh, commissions were a factor of that or, or a percentage of that. So what drives crop insurance A&O are the premium, uh, excuse me, are the prices of the commodities. And so as you well know, corn, soybeans, wheat make up a large percentage of, of, of that uh, premium or either that guarantee of that liability that that's covered in the nation <clears throat> the downside of that is specialty crop guys they don't have publicly traded crops so when our row crop guys prices are going up um, our premiums are going up so this factor hits us pretty hard but those uh, specialty crop guys aren't getting the benefit of the of their premium going up due to prices, and they're re they're getting a double hit on this. I mean, some of these guys are I, I don't know how they're keeping the doors open. Their their commission is so low on specialty crops, and then at the same time, we're really driving hard to uh, increase uh, coverage, in, uh, cover more crops, uh, and most of that is in the specialty crop business. So we're putting more work on those specialty crop agents and then cutting their uh, 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 commission they're earning. And it's almost impossible to uh, sustain what they're doing, you know, hiring really skilled labor to go out and, and, and service these policies. So I, we're really working uh, really hard to try to get an inflation factor that was in there for five years. For some reason, it was not, it was taken away in 2015. Um, and we and we think and there should just it, all we need to do is implement the inflation factor. Uh, if they could do that, uh, those guys would get a bump in in uh, in, in what the, the how the calculations done, and it would relieve a lot of stress on those guys. And back in the omnibus bill, uh, right at the end of the year, there was bipartisan support that said the administration, the RMA, could implement this inflation factor. But for some reason, uh, we assume the lawyers or whatever uh, it, it, at RMA and uh, USDA uh, don't think that that, uh, uh, don't agree. So for, for some reason, we're in an impasse. We can't figure out why they can't implement the inflation factor right now. So that's one of the biggest things we've been talking to staff about lately. Do you have confidence that that might return? I, I would think factor. so. I mean, very, very, especially this day and age, very few issues do you get both sides of the aisle in both houses are in lockstep with our our opinion. And so <laughs> I, I feel like we're on good footing if all of these guys are agree and ladies are agreeing on this. I I agree. I don't I don't see how you you can't find common ground on something like that but it is always curious why something gets removed and you have to find that veteran staffer to answer that question oh well we had to run that out because and that's what happens in yeah. in those offices yeah you're right so anyway i hope that we can have some resolution there and then we're really working hard um to where we don't have to do this in the future we'd love to have a, a permanent solution a permanent fix to this and this next farm bill so, and we're working on uh, with, with with the House and the uh, Senate on on uh, resolution for that. Maybe we can get it in this next farm bill. 
you're talking about the inflation thing that that's you correct permit. yes that's okay right. all right yeah uh, every five years when this comes around and uh did you know when you took the chairmanship of this that you'd be as involved in these negotiations as uh as you are uh no, I, I didn't. I, it, it seems to, <laughs> I seem to be getting more involved. <laughs> but you know, it, it's a, it's an honor to be asked to do this, and I, I'm proud, to, proud to represent uh, our, our agents. That I, I, one of these days, I'm going to figure out how many uh, millions of acres that that we actually are insure and, and, and represent. That that would be that'd be good to know. It'd be in, in, it it'd put a little more pressure on me. It'd be a little more intimidating to know how many farm families I'm representing there. Well, and it is. And if it, that's what truly has come out as years have gone on is a, is a good way to stabilize things for the producer. I think your role is valuable and that's why you do get to have a, a seat at the table. Yeah, you're right. And any, in, 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 on that same, uh, uh, on the witnesses there on that, that Senate hearing, um, you know, half of the panel were, were ag bankers. And I, I don't know uh, if you uh, picked up on that, uh, how reliant those ag bankers are on our crop insurance. So, uh, you know, they, they really hit home where half the panel were, were lenders and half the panel were crop insurance representatives. So uh, you, you can tell uh, it adds another, another level of importance to making sure that we protect crop insurance. This was not your first time testifying in front of the Senate. What was your other time? Uh, prior to the 18 farm bill, I did, uh, um, and uh, you know, we, it's. Uh, I will tell you, it, like I said, it's an honor, but it's also a very intimidating experience. Uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you you think you're prepared, but you also uh, you have in the back of your mind uh, that you're going to get a question that just that really uh, you're not prepared for, and. And the first time there wasn't a dairy policy, and, and dairy's got a really good DRP policy now. And, and at that time there wasn't one. There were a lot of talks about dairy, and, and actually Senator Savinow uh, hit me with a question on dairy. And I, you know, you, you can ride through the Delta of Mississippi, and you can't find a single dairy. So uh, I, I, I think I answered the question pretty good. But then I got to thinking, if she asked a follow up, I was probably in really bad trouble there. So, well, but, let's let's be honest. There's enough of those where they have a piece of paper that gets handed to them to ask. <laughs> they don't know the follow up to ask either. And you'd probably you could put the here's here's what you do, William. Next time, I want you to turn around and say, "Well, do you have a follow up? Uh, could you ask that a different way for me?" And see how see how they do. Yeah, because right? they have so many hearings. I'm not trying to to gang up on a, a politician, but they have so many different hearings that they're a part of that that's. That's where good staff work comes into play. Yeah. In that particular uh, Senate hearing, uh, it, uh, S uh, Chairman uh, Roberts <clears throat> and, and, uh, and, and Senator Chuck Grassley were, were on that committee at that time. And so um, I tell you what, those guys have been around a whole lot longer than me. And that I always re can remember that, remembering those guys asking questions. That, that's, that was a memorable experience. Well, Senator Grassley, Senator Roberts, well, and, and really Senator Stabenow, they've yeah. all done a couple of farm bills. And, yeah, you don't want to get into a debate with them if you're not prepared. <laughs> That's for sure, yeah. Uh, but you can do what a lot of witnesses have done. I've seen it in hearings. You're like, I'm going to have to get back to you. I'll get back to your staff on that. You know, just answer it that way and move on. That's what Yeah, yeah, I was help prepared for that. <laughs> I had that one filed away. <laughs> Uh, so the experience, you, you said that first time was a little eye opening. Mm. Second time, did you feel a more, a little more comfortable and felt like you could handle any of those follow-ups that came your way? Yeah, I, I, I did. It, you know, I wouldn't want to do it again next week. That's for sure. But I, uh, I, I felt a lot more prepared. Uh, this time I was prepared. I don't know if you've ever noticed there's a little box in front of you and it has uh, green, yellow, red as you're doing your opening testimony. So, you know, us guys from Mississippi don't talk real fast, you know, and w when that yellow light came on, I kind of kicked it in overdrive. <laughs> I want to make sure I finished within the five minute time frame. You went from 10 words a minute to 20. You really you jumped right. it up. I'm picking on you, William. Um, <laughs> where do you see what's the best case scenario that comes out of these discussions for producers across the country when it comes to crop insurance? What's your number one and, and number two uh, priority expansions if you get a perfect bill on from where you sit you know uh right now uh they just they, as i mentioned there, there's bipartisan support in both houses uh for crop insurance and we feel really good uh you know like i mentioned the first thing is just protect what we have you know watch these last minute 
uh, amendments that always seem to get thrown there that just, you know, that want to just cut the legs out from under the program. We've got to guard against that. Uh, but, you know, feel really good about getting that, air, uh, that excuse me, that A&O fix that I mentioned. Uh, I feel good. There's a lot of talks about uh, that changing that subsidy around. If not with the underlying policy, maybe the ECO, SCO, uh, that's a county level based uh, over the top coverage. Uh, so, you know, there. So anyway, I, I feel real good. I, you know, it, it seems to be more talk on uh, improving the program. Uh, than 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 doing any damage to it. So and and every office we've talked to is is really open to to any suggestion that we might have. So as you well know, uh, it, you know our suggestions all have to be scored. Uh, and you know and you got to try to figure out what's a CBO a score it. So there's always you, you can have the best idea in the world, but you got to pay for it somehow. <laughs> Is Washington broken? Uh, you know, you hear all these things in the two times. Do you think it's fixed enough and working enough that you're going to be able to get some type of good piece of legislation? You know, so this this is the best takeaway from talking with some high ranking uh, 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 members um, is, is they have to get this debt ceiling situation resolved. Um, and then I think then I think if that happens, and then I think the farm bill. The farm bill goes through relatively smoothly, but uh, because uh, Senator Stabenow uh, is really pushing, uh, and, and, uh, and she and she's working really well uh, with Senator Bozeman from Arkansas, the ranking member there, um, and Senator Thompson uh, is working the House side, as you well know. Uh, you know they they're asking for a lot of money to be added to SNAP, uh, and, and that is tied with our crop insurance and, and Title One programs. So. Um, and so you, you've got to be able, I think, I think we have some real leadership on both sides that, that can, uh, that, that can negotiate and compromise to where, uh, I think we can get a farm bill done. I feel, I feel pretty good about it, but like I said, I'm, I'm more concerned right now with, with figuring out this debt, debt limit deal. Aren't we all <laughs> <laughs> Try to figure it out? William Cole, I appreciate your time. Thank you so very much for it. And, uh, I'll keep an eye out for you next time I see you there in the Senate. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it and appreciate you asking me to join today. My thanks to William Cole. New episodes of the MTOM Show podcast come out each and every Tuesday. We appreciate you taking time to watch, listen, or read. We'll see you next time.